I have to start out by reminding viewers that when we lobbied Congress to pass the Organic uh, Foods Production Act uh, as part of the 1990 Farm Bill, so we were uh, testifying in front of Congress in the late 1980s, as was the USDA, who testified against the bill. They didn't want any part of uh, regulating organics. We, we needed a level playing field. There were a lot of problems, growth problems back then as organic was um, commercializing. And what we envisioned as this very unique public-private partnership has evolved into sadly an adversarial relationship. And it has been during every single administration since the law has passed, Republican and Democrat. Yeah, the, the big shots at Bayer, Monsanto, Sargenta, um, they don't really like organics and, uh, and they're, um, they're um, I, I don't wanna say minions, but their partners at the USDA um, it, have created really a hostile situation. At, at first, corporate agribusiness uh, attacked organics and then they bought organics. They bought most of the major brands and they produce most of the organic eggs. Um, we constantly need to remind the political appointees and bureaucrats at the USDA to enforce the law, the current law, not this proposed law, the current law that uh, there's been gross deficiencies. What do they not understand about the current uh, enabling legislation and regulations that say all organic livestock must have access to the outdoors. Every law means something. If, if you hold a public events, uh, operate a public events space, and it says you have to have two forms of egress and you're on the second floor, they don't just mean a door with a drop down to the street level, there has to be a fire safe. So when we say access to the outdoors, we have to really create an environment where animals can choose to go out. That doesn't happen right now. Doesn't sound very complicated, but it, it's not happening by choice. Through my travels around the country, and I probably visited more organic hen houses and broiler houses than anyone, there are no birds out. It's a rare example when there are birds out and almost exclusively on family scale farms. All too often, there's like a couple small doors that open out, token doors, and there might be 10 to 50,000 birds in a building, and there might be five to 15 birds outside. The open the door, the ones that just kind of fall out or they're kind of goofy, but there's no reason for them to go outside. So first, uh, uh, next, uh, just a little bit of history. First, we had outdoor access. That's what we envisioned. That's what the law says. And then we had, uh, and that included pastured poultry, people that really did a great job of even moving mobile coops through the pasture or creating enough space outside their buildings and giant overhead garage doors and all kinds of easy ways for birds to get out. Then we had porched poultry, porched poultry. How did that happen? A company in Massachusetts called the Country Hen uh, wanted to enter organic production and they applied for certification. The first thing you have to do is uh, file with your certifier, your OSP, your organic system plan, a blueprint of how you're gonna operate your organization. And it said that, although the law said the birds had to have access to the outdoors, what they were providing for outdoors was a very small screen porch. Uh, and their certifier said, well, we're not gonna certify you, that doesn't constitute the outdoors. And so he went shopping for a certifier and got another one. And they said, we're not gonna certify you, that's not the outdoors. He got smarter. Instead of going to a third certifier, he went to the then director of the National Organic Program at the USDA, appealing the decision by the certifier. In about 72 hours, and this is at an agency where when the community asks for rulemaking and guidance, it takes sometimes years or literally decades. In 72 hours, the director uh, instructed the certifier to certifier the country hen. The certifier went to court, lost on standing, um, uh, 
and and so bingo now the biggest uh conventional egg producers in the united states with millions of birds saw the green light to enter organics they built buildings single buildings with 190,000 birds each with a small little fenced or screened in porch along the side concrete floor metal roof and these little teeny doors that go out well if you think that's the outdoors i think you better look up the definition but even if you and i the audience agreed that yes that's the outdoors if that space will only hold one to three percent of the birds in that massive building I will testify that 97% of that birds have no access to the outdoors. Remember the law says all livestock must have access. We've told this to the USDA. We filed legal complaints against these outfits. The USDA has refused to uh, act. They need better rules. So what do these new rules look like? Um, during uh, Mr. Vilsack's tenure, USDA Secretary Vilsack, uh, his tenure at the USDA during the uh, eight years of the Obama administration. At the very beginning, they committed to cleaning up the mess in uh, livestock facilities for uh, cows and, and poultry. It didn't happen for cows at all. It happened in January 2017. While, while Mr. Obama and Vilsack were lame ducks, that they... Uh, published a rule in the Federal Register, which the Trump administration, like a lot of last minute rules, uh, deep sixed. And uh, not, so now they have a, a new draft rule that's going to clean up all these problems in organic um, uh, poultry production. And the lobbyists of the Organic Trade Association are applauding. Many of the other NGOs that work in organics have declared victory. We finally got even the humane uh, uh, groups in the United States. This is gonna be a great step forward. However, this rule is profoundly deficient and it will institutionalize livestock factory production in organic eggs and poultry um, and, and broiler houses, period. This is a factory farm friendly rule. Why do I say that? Outdoors. Remember, you got to give them space outdoors. Right now, you have to give them space to uh, um, enjoy their natural instinctive behaviors. Um, and for chickens, that's the scratching. It's called foraging behavior. Scratching, peck, 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 scratching. They're trying to under, uh, under, um, undercover, uncover weed seeds, uh, uh, grass, um, uh, bugs, invertebrates. Um, and... Uh, they can't do that. So they can't do that because this new rule will only provide one to two square feet per bird outside. If you actually got all the birds to go outside, they'd immediately make a moonscape by urinating, defecating, trampling, eating the vegetation, it'd be gone. And there are other parts of the organic law that says we cannot do anything to degrade the um, uh, fertility of the soil or the environmental uh, standards that, that are uh, properly exercised on a farm. So one to two square feet. One of the marketers in the United States, Organic Valley, which generally has smaller houses, requires five square feet. We can't even do that. In Europe, they require 43 square feet for, per chicken. A lot of times that's enough room that they can rotate and rest in an area for the grass to regrow. The humane labeling in the United States that the gold standard is 106 square feet. And this rule is one to two square feet. That won't do anything to get the birds out. They'll destroy the environment and it won't add to the flavor and nutrition of the birds. It gets better folks. Of that one to two square feet outdoors, you can pave with concrete or gravel half the space. Right now, usually there might be a three to six foot band around the building of gravel so that drainage takes place and to discourage rodents from coming near the building. But that's gonna be a lot bigger with this new law. So why don't the birds go out now? And why won't this rule uh, impact the, the birds' interest in, in going outside? First of all, inhospitable environment outside. There's no food, 
There's no water. There's little, if any, shade. It's trampled down and compacted. Well, now it's going to be concrete or maybe compacted. They Right now, they use these very small doors, literally this wide and high. And they typically uh, open out. The birds are instinctively concerned with avian predators. They want to see, before they leave the building, they want to see the sky to make sure there isn't a hawk or owl or some other bird that's going to have them for lunch. They taste like chicken, they're great. So those doors are an impediment. Some farmers that have put in tall doors, the same kind of doors that you and I would walk through, the birds can see way more birds go out. Crowded indoor conditions. Some of these birds are literally wall to wall. If there are aviary systems with glorified cages, they don't have a door on the cage, but the birds are trapped because there are so many birds on every level that you can't leave. There's no way that the birds, except for right around this little door, are ever going to get to be outside. So some of these uh, barns that are five or 10,000 birds in the United States, which have overhead garage doors or plenty of these taller doors, the birds go out and then the other birds take their place. But that's never going to happen under these existing laws. I should emphasize, forget about 190,000 square foot buildings. Uh, forget about 100, I'm sorry, forget about 190,000 birds in a building, in a flock. Forget about the standard for many other businesses that are uh, 20 to 40,000 birds in the building. Forget about uh, these uh, sm smaller operators that have, might, might have five or 10,000 birds. In Europe, again, a flock is limited to 3,000 birds. And you can have more than one flock on a farm, but that gives you a more intimate relationship with the outdoors per bird, per flock. Um, so all of these things are going to discourage the bird, but there's a new discouragement. If the buildings presently have these tiny porches, uh, the birds have to, they can be counted as part of the one to two square feet. So it makes the, uh, and it makes the natural area even smaller. You count the porches, you count the concrete and gravel. It's going to be such a long distance that they're never going to get out to the natural world. But then that you have these small and close porches. They can't even really see the outdoors with the roof and the partial walls. Uh, so forget about any more chickens going out. We're going to have the status quo, giant corporate agribusinesses operating giant buildings with no birds out. Let's turn to indoors. One to one and a half square feet, depending on the weight of the birds. Uh, per, per, you know, how do you like to live in a little piece of paper? This is a little smaller than a square foot, but uh, we're talking about a minute amount of space. Um, it's uh, very unnatural. It's uh, not a happy life for these birds. Um, when you talk about aviaries, aviaries, I'm sorry, not only is the floor jammed with birds, but every level above them to the ceiling. Many of these buildings are two stories. That's another impediment to going out. So I, I'm going to predict that we're going to see these little pat, these little ramps from a second story and these are tall industrial buildings down to the ground then we have the concrete then we're going to have a little pathway out to the 40 acres way far away where a car might walk out to but a chicken's never going to go that far from the security of their building but that's going to give them one to two square feet in outdoor access um, so indoors aviaries now if the birds are indoors the porches, if they're still screened, will count as the inside. And so that will even effectively provide less than one to two square feet indoors. You can, sub you can subtract the porches and the birds don't go out on these little porches. Less than 1% of the birds, way less than 1%. Um, so uh, there's, no la there's no longer going to be a requirement for natural light. You can get rid of all the windows and have all artificial lighting. Right now, the law is interpreted that um, uh, an inspector has to be able to basically read their paperwork inside without the lights on on a nice, clear day. Um, pullets, the young birds, uh, they're 16 weeks old by uh, in, at the point that they're moved to the laying house. Zero access to access 
pasture. Those pull on houses don't have to let their birds out at all. And then if that's not enough, folks, they can be confined in the layer house for an additional five weeks so they, quote, get right used to their nesting boxes. When I go to family size farms with hundreds of birds or 2,000 or 5,000 or even 10,000 birds, uh, the people growing the pullets tell me we let them out as soon as they want to go out in, in, a, in conducive weather, and, and they might be two weeks old. And uh, maybe even younger. It depends on the weather. They just open the doors. The birds make the ch choice. And, um, and I ask these operators, how long does it take to get used to the nesting boxes? We're a matter of a few days. But this is the way the, the factory farm operators have testified that they want to operate. And the USDA gave them everything they want. So broilers, the, these are being produced by companies like Tyson. Uh, they import their feed. There's nothing organic about the operation other than the house is organic. Uh, they, uh, I visited all these operations in different scales. No broilers are outside. Now they are on the farm I buy from my local farmer and they rotate on fresh pasture and that's why my chicken tastes great. But these conventional outfits don't wanna let their chickens out. They, they raise the same fast growing breeds that, that are uh, mature in four to six weeks. And so to comply with the law, they might open the door for the last week or two. The birds don't go out. They've never been out their entire life. Again, it's inhospitable conditions. The birds aren't out. What will this change to the new law? Nothing. The birds won't be out. Uh, beak trimming. Now, many of the sp farmers, the smallest farmers I deal with, they don't modify the beaks at all. The birds leave the hen house, whether it's a fixed house or a mobile coop, they have enough space. They're not uh, under great stress. But when you cram birds together, they start getting uh, aggressive and injuring their flock mates. So uh, some of the uh, operators will just tip the beak, just take the small, sharp tip off so they can't injure each other. This allows for uh, trimming the beak pretty radically, not de-beaking, not taking the whole beak off, which is pretty grotesque that I've seen, but taking a significant amount of the beak off. And again, if you get your birds outside, which they're not really going to be outside, but if you got your birds outside, that foraging behavior depends on a healthy beak. They can't do. They can't exhibit their nat natural instinctive behavior as the law requires uh, without a beak and an intact, really healthy beak. So um, th do they need to do that? Well, they only need to do that if they're crammed into one and a half or one foot or less inside on these aviaries. Then you might need to trim your beaks, but we don't want them to live that way. People choose organics. They they pay a premium as a as an eater because they want they think they're supporting a different kind of environmental ethic, regenerative, not shipping the feed from overseas that may or may not be organic based on our investigations, and then the manure is all concentrated and becomes a pollutant, and then that, that gets land spread on conventional crops that aren't fed to the chickens. Uh, and they think that. They're spending a premium because the animals are being cared for more respectfully. This isn't respectful. And finally, they think that one of the reasons organic food costs more is that uh, economic justice for family farmers is built right into the price, not these giant industrial facilities and their hard-earned money is going to corporate investors instead of real farmers. So I'm going to stop here and uh, see if we have any questions. Um, I, I want to really encourage uh, organic stakeholders, farmers, ethical business people, consumers. I want to encourage you to make a comment to the USDA. Um, if you go to our website at organici.org, uh, there is an action alert posted on our homepage. It includes instructions on how to and a link to the USDA. It has a link to our our full comments. Uh, so if you want to drill down and study up, there are a few other things to object to. These are the biggies. Um, 
I really encourage you to make your voices heard and tell them why you care about organics and why it appears that this doesn't meet your expectation. There's a link to the full uh, draft rule. You can read the 60 pages just like I did and uh, it's searchable and you can um, go directly there if you want to do your homework. Uh, but we'll, we've tried to make it uh, somewhat easy for you. So uh, go to Organic Eye, click on, it's on the homepage or click on our action alert uh, resources and action alert um, tab. Um, so thank you for being here today. Uh, I know we have some people on Zoom and others on uh, Facebook. Let me tell you that this will be archived. We'll put something on our homepage so you can get to it. Um, and you can get to it through Facebook or the Organic Eye YouTube channel. Uh, and um, those are linked to the press release that you might have received at the bottom. <clears throat> so if you're a real masochist and would like to watch this again, please do. But if you wanna pass it along to friends or family or business associates that care about organics, that care about the integrity of organics, we hope you will pass that along or share our Facebook page or the link, uh, share the posting on the Facebook page. So thank you very much. Krista, do we have any feedback that we'd like to respond to? One quick question. Um, what are a couple of larger egg farms that are truly organic in order to get support from folks? Yeah, okay. Um, I, I would encourage you, first of all, if there's anybody else who has uh, questions, please use the comments feature on, uh, on the Zoom uh, page uh, and the, the comments on Facebook. You can use comments and we'll read those. Um, I, you know, it's, if you look at the Organic Eye website, uh, there's a resources tab and there's something called Castell's Kitchen. I basically share inside knowledge uh, that I've gained in the 35 years that I've been involved in organics as an eater, as a certified organic farmer, uh, involved in um, uh, developing commercial organizations, um, and finally for the last almost 19 years as an organic industry watchdog. So that's inside knowledge. I don't think there's anything on eggs there yet. That'll be our next posting. Um, I want to say that in the hierarchy of eating organically, there are a lot of people who have chickens in their backyards. Then if you buy your organic feed from a certified organic source, uh, you know that the chickens are being well cared for. The next uh, stage down, if we were going to pretend that that was a food pyramid, uh, organic would be certified organic would be the floor. The next uh, echelon down outside your backyard would be your local market. So if you meet a farmer that's certified organic uh, at your farmer's market, or if you go to a specialty store, uh, if you have a uh, member-owned cooperative in your community, that's pretty much the um, gold standard of retailing, kind of a farmer's market seven days a week. They know who they're buying from in the local food shed. Uh, I have found in the 19 years I've do the, done this work, virtually no fraud or misrepresentation on a local level. It doesn't mean it can't occur, but when somebody shakes your hand and looks you in their face and many times invites you to the farm to take a look at the chickens, or they might have an open house uh, once a year, um, that's a lot less likely to be untrustworthy. Uh, the next um, level down that you can find in many stores like Whole Foods um, and uh, um, uh, natural grocers and other chains and, and independent, the, right with the uh, member-owned cooperatives, there are a couple hundred independently owned natural food grocery stores in the United States that are owned by people in your community that really care. So then you might find uh, a couple brands I'll give you is um, uh, Vital Farms and uh, Hanson Brook. Be careful, not all their eggs are certified organic. They are certified by some of these humane outfits that require 106 square feet. When I visit their facilities, and I have scores of them, uh, 
there are about 40 to 60% of their birds out, way more than a standard organic farm. They call it pastured poultry. I don't. I call it enhanced outdoor access. That's what every organic farm should be. Doors on the side, big overhead doors on the end, and lots of space. Um, the real McCoy in pastured poultry, and there are people who uh, some distribute regionally, some distribute locally, so you have to do your homework, are people who have mobile chicken coops who rotate them in the, in the field. Um, they get fresh grass every day, they defecate, they scratch it up, they create fertility, and then they're moved to a new place. Also people raise broilers that way or in chicken tractors, small structures that they move to new grass every single day. That is the ultimate in nutrition. I can tell you from a flavor standpoint, they're beyond compare. There are smaller family farms, like the one I have has a fixed house for chicken, for laying hens. They all scatter. They love being outside. Some of these big corporate farms have uh, literally testified before the National Organic Standards Board, my birds don't want to go outside. Well, I've already given you the reasons those birds don't want to go outside. But when you give them a nice environment, they're all out there. My, my broiler chickens that I buy from the same farm, they have electrified netting and they move the birds into a whole big area every few days when the grass gets uh, eaten down, they have green stuff. So do your homework in your local market, find a pasture poultry producer, couple resources, the Weston A. Price Foundation has local chapters. They know the farmers. Um, Eat Wild is a website and, and, um, and, and um, Eat Wild, and I'm blanking on the other one, but if you email me and you need more resources, uh, then you can connect with farmers in your local area. The, the last thing I do is buy a standard organic egg because a lot of these are private label. You don't know who's producing them. A lot of them, like the ones that might be labeled, um, I'll give you one brand that I would never buy is Eglin's Best. Um, one of their prime producers is a company called Herbrooks. It's a family farm. It's family owned. They are licensed for over a million birds in Southern uh, Michigan. I've been to that facility, almost 200,000 birds per building with those little porches. So it's really hard to know where every egg comes from. People change suppliers on their brands all the time. But if you choose local and it takes homework, it takes time, you will get a vastly superior product, usually without paying much of a premium, if any. And you'll be rewarding economically a farmer in your own community. Really good karma. Uh, Krista, do we have any other last questions? Here's Pippin gets all certified organic food, lucky cat. Um, Sure. Uh, uh, are there, Kristen? what are your thoughts on pasture requirements for dairy? Uh, well, that's a good question because we fought that for years. The, the law says that all organic livestock must have access to the outdoors and all organic ruminants must have access to pasture. And for a long time, the USDA was not enforcing that and the cows were virtually not out. Now we have uh, dairies that produce, um, that, that, that manage literally 1,000 to over 20,000 head of animals. And they're pretending that they're moving the cows out. Some of these are milking three times a day instead of twice a day, like virtually every family farm. When we polled a few years ago, uh, family, uh, all farmers in the United States that were certified organic to milk, we found that the average was one cow per acre. When I did the research, and it's all secretive at the USDA, so I had to go to state regulatory documents through freedom of information laws around the country. Every CAFO, concentrated animal feeding operation, has to file a nutrient management or manure management plan, depending on the nomenclature or the vernacular, depending on what state you're in. Um, and they have to say where they're spreading that manure, where the crops are growing, how many acres of pasture. And I found that some of these have certified organic, five to 10 cows per acre, but their manure management plans state that they're 
harvesting stored crops. They're cutting hay off that same acreage. It doesn't say how much. Let's pretend they're cutting half the annual growth off of those acres to feed during the winter. That would be an effective stocking rate of 10 to 20 cows per acre. That's a joke. In technical terms, that's a joke. And um, so the USD is not effectively enforcing the law. We see the enforcement is virtually secretive. They basically give people warnings. You rob the bank, we'll let you, uh, uh, you don't even have to give us the money back. Well, it's just promise not to do the same violation in the future. We'll let you stay in business. These are businesses that are crushing family scale farmers. Um, and uh, when they do uh, levy a penalty, it's only after a negotiation. They're afraid to take anybody to court. I don't think any uh, illegal operating dairy has ever been taken to court in the history of the USDA's um, uh, uh, oversight, which uh, began in 1990. Uh, uh, so I hope that answers your question. There are still brands that uh, depend on family farmers. Uh, again, there's a uh, uh, Castell's Kitchen episode where I talk about the best brands of yogurt in the United States and uh, milk brands. And I hope you'll tune into that. And if you have follow-up questions on dairy, uh, please feel free to send them through our uh, website. Do we have anybody else? Krista? Yes. So another comment is referencing a video of Cory Booker in the New York Times where he's talking about the power of the industrial ag lobby. And the question is, is there any movement in making the general public more aware of the control that this lobby has on our food system? That's an absurd, uh, um, ab ab that's a really good comment. Astute comment is what I wanted to try to say. Because the, the agribusiness lobbyists run the USDA. It doesn't matter who's in there, conventional or organic. And most of the resources and interest goes to conventional agriculture. In some countries in Europe, they understand that um, in organics, we're in the pollution prevention business. We're in the cancer prevention business. It's much uh, more cost effective to change the way we grow and process food in this country than it is to pay for remediating these problems after the fact. We have the cheapest food in the world, bar none, and the most expensive healthcare. We're spending uh, just about six to 8% of our no gross national product on food, at least before inflation started kicking in, and uh, about 16 to 18% on healthcare, pushing towards 20. It was the opposite a few decades ago. So uh, that investment is a really poor investment because compared to other industrialized countries, our longevity has been reduced. We have more chronic disease, more infant mortality. Um, uh, we're really not getting a good payback. And so in, in um, Washington, uh, when the uh, Obama administration was talking about clamping down on eggs in this Senate uh, Agriculture Committee, it was Democratic Senator Stabenow um, uh, from uh, Michigan. Uh, who were defending Herbrooks and uh, the chairman who was a Republican from Kansas defending another giant million bird operation from Cal Maine, one of the biggest uh, conventional egg producers. And they were in unison saying, you can't do this. You're going to hurt farmers. Like they're calling those giant investment, uh, multi-million dollar investment, hundreds of millions of dollars investment, family farmers. What who, the farmers who've been hurt are the ones uh, from not enforcing the law. So this is a macro problem in Washington. Why should organics be any different than any other regulatory scheme? Because we said so when the law was passed. It incorporated the National Organic Standards Board as a buffer, an expert panel, as a, a, to buffer between the organic stakeholders between the lobbyists and the rule makers. The problem is that uh, during the Obama administration, the Trump administration, um, we have stacked the National Organic Standards Board with um, either members 
or award winners or collaborators with the, the Organic Trade Association, the, the primary lobby in the organic industry. And guess what? They're not on our side. It's an adversarial situation. They basically purged most of the um, uh, exemplary members of that panel. And even the few good ones are up against the wall because uh, it takes a two thirds super majority to pass uh, substantive rulemaking or recommendations for rulemaking. And uh, we don't have the votes any longer. So I don't have the answer other than uh, we need to take back our government, uh, whether it's the FDA regulating uh, drugs and, and medical devices, whether it's the EPA regulating chemicals and allowing chemicals that they've banned long ago in Europe. Uh, money talks in America and the lobbyists are the agents. And, you know, I love democracy. I, I refuse to admit that our government is for sale. I adamantly say it's not for sale, but it's for lease. Every two to six years in Congress and every four years in the White House, uh, you pony up the not just the money to hire the lobbyists, but you pony up the federal campaign cash. And we all need to work on restoring our democracy so our vote means more. Krista? That's it. That's it. Okay. I thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Please uh, try to uh, forward the emails you've received or share the um, Facebook postings, or I think there's, there is something on, uh, the action alert is on Twitter, although we aren't very active on Twitter. If you are, you can forward that along. And, um, and we will have a, a, a archived copy of this video. Uh, so you can share that with people too. Thank you very much, Krista. Thank you for your technical assistance. I wanna thank everybody for participating and caring about these issues. Bye-bye from Wisconsin.